For your birthday, Alan, I'm going to make a Constantine pinata. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> I'm going to fill it with tracks and uh, Gideon Bibles. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to IrenaCast. We are the weekly podcast dedicated to conversations on faith and culture. We are your hosts. I'm Jeff. I'm Mona. And I'm Alan. And for the very first time in IrenaCast history, we have the majority of our hosts in the same room. That means we could stage a coup and take things over, right? I think so. Yeah, majority rules. I'm feeling a little bit nervous because <laughs> I'm not with you. Mona is live in the studio. In the studio. Studio is a strong word, but. <laughs> Jeff is the person who makes everything happen. In case you didn't know that. He's the audio. I'm in the bat case. Mm -hmm. Well, the perk about recording at Jeff's today is that I get to play with the babies. And oh my word, I think my face hurt from smiling so much last night. <laughs> Those kids. So Jeff has two twin daughters that are about to turn two and they are so funny. I can't even explain how funny they are, but they were showing me their baby sign language skills last night. So there's, they've got a little book and they'll say, they know the words for like house and teacher and school and happy. They know all the sign language for it. And it was so cute to watch their little hands because they can't, <laughs> they don't have finger dexterity yet. So they're like, you know, so like the sign for I love you, for example, you know, you put your like your third and fourth finger down and the rest are up. Like I love you. They can't do it, but they try so hard. Like you can watch them staring at their hands, like move fingers, move. It's so just killed me. <laughs> Adorable. Yeah. How about you guys? What are you? Do? <laughs> How are you doing? Good. I've I've been on an ancestry dot com kick lately over the past couple of weeks. Oh, um, that doesn't surprise anyone. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but pretty cool. I put a collage together, and this is this is an exact number. I found thirty four pictures of my direct ancestors. Parents, grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents. Would they also be my direct ancestors? Half of them would be. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. And so I, I put all their photos kind of next to each other and, and looked at them. And it, now it's like a almost like a collection, like a hobby. I'm trying to collect all the pictures of my direct ancestors. And it's really fun. The, my favorite one of all, his name is uh, Thomas Stout. I don't know if you saw this on Facebook, but I posted about it because I get really excited. He's uh, my third great grandfather. So my father's mother's father's mother's father. And he he was a reverend in the Brethren Church. So he, like me, obviously way before me in the 1800s, was a pacifist. And he was into nonconformity. And he had a chin strap beard, just like me. Oh, keep it in the family. Alan, you should listen to the latest episode of... This American Life, it's all based off of journal entries. So they find these stories and old journal entries, and then they, they tell the stories. I was thinking about you the whole time I was listening. I would love to would love to listen to that. The thing that bothers me about other people who collect journals, so I've actually found a few people, and they tend to prefer like war diaries and sailing diaries, people on the high seas. And to me, that's not super boring. I want to hear about like... <laughs> what people ate for lunch? Like that's Yeah, what you <laughs> that's what I want to know. I want to know like... Housewives like talking about their families or I don't know, farming. That's what I get into. That does make that's definitely more interesting, just like everyday life things that we could sort of relate to and find out how they did stuff. I, I can see that. I don't I don't get it, man, but I'm I'm glad it makes you happy. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I still think it's weird that you uh are like a time traveling voyeur, but other <laughs> <laughs> that shit that's my official title, I think. That that's your Twitter handle, right? Time traveling you should, you should do that. <laughs> The time traveling voyeur. Okay, I don't. <laughs> Maybe we'll introduce you at the top of the show like that. That's like one step away from Uncle Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Joke from last week, guys. You gotta go look it up now. You gotta see it. You gotta see it. All right, so we have another first as far as our podcast is concerned. This week, uh, we are taking our first listener requested topic. So this, uh, our request came in from Roger who emailed the podcast and said, I would like to request a podcast on the topic of heaven and hell. What is the biblical view, historical view, cultural view? Uh, he said, you mentioned this uh, topic a few podcasts back and have been waiting. So, Roger, wait no longer. On the other side of the music, we will be discussing this very topic. So 
So, heaven and hell. I feel like we should have brought back the the dun 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 sound effect for this one when we say hell. But it's it's gone forever. It's dead and buried, never to be resurrected. <laughs> so uh, I think the best way for us to start is let's kind of start with uh, because there's obviously specifics that our um, our listener Roger really wanted to go over, and I know we'll go over it because I we have our resident biblical scholar with us as usual in Alan. Um, but I think that uh, maybe it would be good for us to start because I think we can safely say that all of us at one point in our life were um, very sure about what we believed about heaven and hell. Would you say that that's probably correct? It's correct for me, but I mean, at the moment, I can only think of two things. I can only think of that song, heaven, heaven, heaven. And then also the third eagle video that we watched yesterday. Yay. Third eagle <laughs> of the apocalypse. You guys are together. So did, <laughs> did he show it to you? Yes. I cringed. So this, it's this guy who like writes songs on his keyboard and this particular one was called doom and gloom, but it was such this really poppy sort of do, 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 do. And it's all about hell and, and the, and the, the second coming and, and doom and gloom and, don't don't watch pornography. Like the lyrics are really bizarre. Very, and his rhyming skills are are pretty good. They they rival that of any you know MC. He's a there. good rhymer. Yeah, and he's green screened to like a flowing river behind him. I'm so pretty, it's even, I think I'm pretty it's sure live. it's not green screen. It's live, dude. <laughs> he carts all of that out there. Well, if, if, obviously, side note in the show notes on irenacast.com slash eighteen, we'll put the link to the video and tell us your thoughts on whether it is green screened or not, because I'm pretty sure it's not. But anyway, so I, I think that brings up an interesting point. Um, one of my earliest sermons when I was like 19 years old was on the passage in Romans that talks about human beings being objects of wrath before they're saved, and I think um, I think for a lot of my life in church. I learned that the default setting for humans was punishment, was we were all headed to hell because we have all sinned against God in some way. Just being born, that's like original sin, or because of the acts that we take, we are all headed for hell. That is what we deserve. And God, out of mercy, has plucked some people from falling into this punishment to be saved. Yeah, I think for me... In a Pentecostal church, it was always very spiritual, like a lot of demon and hell talk. A lot of the books that I was recommended when I was in uh, late high school were 30 Minutes in Hell and 30 Minutes in Heaven or all these books where people had these visions of going to heaven and hell and describing what it was like. And for a lot of the people that I came that I came in contact with within a Pentecostal circles, those became almost priority over what scripture says about that, which obviously we'll get into, but that... These these images that these writers were putting in these books became became their doctrine as far as what they believed heaven and hell would look like. Yeah, and for me, it could not be divorced from the end times stuff. Um, ah, yes, right. It was like a big really? deal, and yeah, every time we talked about heaven and hell, it was like um, always sort of tied to the second coming because that was going to happen any minute. So that's more what you talked about instead of like death that's inevitable for everybody. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, no, I think it's it's interesting, and I know. A couple of years ago when Rob Bell wrote Love Wins, right? That was like a huge scandal for a lot of people. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think of like what's come up like in the news sort of recently. Um, a lot of a lot of people have, I think, coming out of the evangelical exodus has re- have changed their opinions on afterlife. Is that pretty safe to say? Or starting to change. Or starting to change. Or There's a pretty big movement. If you look up, for instance, the conference on rethinking hell, there's a lot of evangelicals, evangelicals who are rethinking the concept of the traditional eternal conscious punishment that a lot of churches have embraced over the last 1500 years. And the way I see it is that the hell is really like um, a domino effect theologically Um, for a lot of people, including myself, is that once you change your opinions on hell, like you're not going to talk about Jesus in the same way. You're not going to talk about salvation in the same way um, or maybe even sin in the same way. You're not going to talk about the end times in the same way. I mean, it's, it's like, to me, it's kind of a crux of so many like ripple effects. So I think this is a pretty pretty interesting topic. And I think that it's important too is for people that I think are, that believe wholeheartedly in uh, heaven and hell, I don't think that there's a realization that those ideas haven't been around for a long time. And even the, the, the view of the afterlife, and we've talked about this before in other podcasts, that there's not even a consistent view within scripture about what is an afterlife. And the Bible's view of the afterlife was heavily influenced by what people around them believed. 
and how they incorporated those thoughts into what they already believed. So it's actually in the Bible and, and everything you're saying is true. It, there's a prog- almost like a progressing sort of approach to afterlife. You get the Old Testament. There is no mention of hell anywhere. <laughs> People disagreed all the way up until the time of Jesus over whether there was going to even be a resurrection to some sort of heaven. There was not this idea that the, an afterlife somewhere existed. What you do get in the Old Testament that sometimes people translate hell is the word sheol. Um, and it just meant the grave. And it was developed like in exile in some of the later writings in the Old Testament. And then beginning in the New Testament, it was developed into the idea of like a temporal underworld that was like in the center of the earth where people after they died would wait for one day if there was a resurrection when the resurrection would happen and everybody would be judged. So it wasn't this concept of like what you were talking about, Jeff, Dante or Milton or some of these later literary figures that developed these like really big epics about, you know, the seven layers of hell and Dante and Paradise Lost with Milton and you know, angels. And is Sheol the concept like it's the same thing as Abraham's bosom that's referred to like a holding place? That's what it evolved into. So that's that's the, the idea of like paradise and the place where the righteous are going to is a little bit different that that is a development. But just like Sheol was basically the grave. And unfortunately, when we read the Old Testament with a Christian lens, we immediately think like, oh, they're talking about hell the way that I understand hell. And we read back into the text what we think sh- it should mean instead of reading what the author intended, re- reading what was understood at the time. Let's pause and talk about that for a moment, because I, I think that is a new concept for some people that um, what it means to read the Old Testament with Christian eyes or a Christocentric sort of lens is what you would call it, or a typological lens where, for example, you're seeing certain figures as Jesus before Jesus. Um, And a lot of scholars think that this is really doing a disservice to the Jewish Bible, right? The Jewish, the Jewish scriptures. They, even though, even in a lot of academic circles, the words Old Testament, that phrase is not appropriate um, because it's we use Hebrew Bible Hebrew instead. Bible because it's Christianizing those Hebrew scriptures that are considered holy by by Jewish people. And right? we do that even with, not with just hell, but with heaven. I mean, the language that we have in a lot of evangelical circles is heaven. It's this place that we go to. But the the idea of heaven, even in early churches, and Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, but it comes from the debate over the resurrection was a debate over the day of the Lord when Israel would be restored to their kingdom and everything would be thing and everything would be restored to what it was like during the time of David, which is where they get the Messiah and all of that kind of stuff. And the idea of heaven was not that they would they would die and go off to this place and everything they lived in would be destroyed, but that the world itself would be like a resurrected body. Everything would be made new. It would be this day of the Lord where everything, so it's still very earthly. And it, for some reason in Christianity, it evolved into this other place that we'd leave everything here behind and we'd go to this new place and forget all about it. Yeah. The, yeah. It, that, that point cannot be overstated, that the idea and the concept of, of paradise of resurrection and restoration is a very this worldly vision that the prophets and the new Testament has when you get people developing like um, premillennialism and the rapture and those kinds of things, they, you have people interpreting the symbols and revelation, which were really talking about things that were going on at the time that the writer was writing. They'll take some of this symbolism and say, well, the earth is going to be destroyed and we are going to go somewhere else and and wait, you know, in heaven and then a new earth will be made. But really, the thrust of all of the prophecy that you look at in the Old Testament is saying God will be restoring this earth and people, especially in the New Testament, will be res- a resurrected part of this kind of recreation of things, not as if we're going somewhere else. N.T. Wright does a lot of really good stuff on this, specifically his book on Surprise by Hope that really kind of lays that stuff out. So if anyone's interested, we'll put a link for that in the show notes. But it it, it lays that out really nicely, I think. And also I'm thinking of, you know, we talked about the contested versus uncontested letters of Paul. In the uncontested letters of Paul, there's a really strong sense that um, the resurrection is so imminent, like within the generation of Paul and Paul's followers and Paul is really intent on this idea of glory bodies. Do you know my, have you studied that much, Alan? I, I know what text you're referring to, but I haven't like read a book called Glory Bodies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> it, it, in, in the ancient Near East in this world, there was a, a, a wide understanding or a wide belief that resurrection and, and, you know, so you have like the, um, the Essenes and the, um, 
Pharisees and the Sadducees, all these kind of groups that had different concepts of what the resurrection was and what it meant. Um, but Paul was probably part of the group um, of an Essene group that believed in resurrection. They believed that really soon Christ as the Messiah, the Messianic figure would come and restore Israel. But they literally believed that like the dead would rise and have these kind of like new glory bodies like, made out of the stuff of the stars, made of like an undestructible sort of stuff. And they believed that like literally this was going to happen in their generation. Like Christ would come paving the way back to Jerusalem. And as Christ came like on, on his train, like all of these glory bodies, all these people would be resurrected with, with eternal sorts of bodies that they can inhabit that wouldn't be destroyed by this world or couldn't be destroyed by governments or powers that be. So it's to like, to like decontextualize that idea from its political construct or uh, context and its um, cultural context and to take it into today and take it out of time and out of, out of culture and out of, you know, all the different ways that this idea was developed throughout, throughout history is really doing a disservice again to these texts. So we can come back to that over and over and over again, especially in the context in my mind of hell. So I'm, you know, come from a pseudo Baptist background. So when we talk about the afterlife, I basically want to talk about hell. <laughs> That's what I get excited about because, <laughs> get because excited about hell. yeah, it's like excited <laughs> about because exactly what you're saying, Mona applies to hell. We have this context where the Jewish temple is about to be destroyed for some of the writings of the new Testament. And then for some of them, they happen later than the destruction of the temple. And you have this like imminent sense that the Romans are coming to bring judgment on Israel. And you can even read the gospels as saying like, Hey, the kingdom of Jesus is not the kingdom of Israel necessarily. It's not this Jewish uprising and revolt. You should actually flee to the mountains when you see the destruction coming. So when you, when you hear the apocalyptic language of um, imminent destruction or even imminent restoration, like you're talking about, you have to realize that they're not creating um, a systematic theology of the afterlife as if there was this heaven and this hell. And, and this is an ultimate you know, experience. Although there are some elements of that, the main focus of the sayings in the new Testament, when they talk about hell is this impending um, destruction of the temple and, and Jewish culture. And then also when later Christian writings happen, it's this idea that we are oppressed by the Roman pagans and someday we will have victory over them when God establishes the kingdom. So to take it out of those contexts and just say, oh, this is talking about hell the way I understand it is to miss what it's actually talking about. Yeah. So I think what you're saying, and I agree, is like concepts of heaven and hell as are presented to us in like apocalyptic literature, for example, like in Revelation or like in Daniel, those are actually referring to present now realities in this world. Yes. They're not referring to after death. So that's, I think, the biggest takeaway we can think of is like most of the imagery is not referring to after everybody dies and goes somewhere else. It's talking about the political realities now. So I think that's what, that's what we're trying to get at with all of these comments. And, and to, to just further illustrate that. Oh, but what, what I mean by now, I mean by back then. Sorry. <laughs> not today. Us Although today. if I was preaching, I would say, yes, you know, hell is a reality, reality today. Anyway, to, to further illustrate what you're saying. So she always used in the Old Testament to talk about the de- you know, death or the grave eventually got developed into this kind of underworld. And then in the, in the New Testament, um, it's changed into Hades or Hades, which is like the Greek version. When you're reading the Greek version of the Old Testament that you know Jesus would have had, that, that the New Testament church had, you see it translated. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if Jesus had it, but I know the New Testament authors had it. You see the Old Testament shield translated to Hades in the Greek, in the Septuagint. There are a lot of variations about what Hades meant, especially concerning like who would be there and how long it would be. But in the time of the new Testament, it's only a temporal place. It is only a holding place for the judgment that would happen eventually in the future. So what happens after the judgment? Be- well, before we get there, there's also okay. one, one more word that, that I'd like to throw out there. There's a word that's commonly translated hell that actually Jesus used. It's used 12 times in the new Testament. 11 of those are used by Jesus. And it's the word Gehenna, which comes from, I'm sure you guys both know what this is. Well, we talked it, about it in another episode, Yeah, but let's talk about it again. Yeah, Gehenna. Sure. So Gehenna is like the Greek translation of the Hebrew Gehenom, which is um, the Valley of Hinnom. 
It's referring to an actual place outside of the walls of Jerusalem where in ancient times, like way before Jesus, children would be sacrificed to idols. And then, you know, these apostate Israelites would go out there and worship other idols. And then it became a trash heap where things were burned and literally just this giant pit where people would throw stuff to be burned outside the walls of Jerusalem. So I'm sorry to interrupt, Alan. So would you say that that the word Gehenna became over time because of everything that happened in that place and what it was, it became an idiom for some place you did not want to go. Yes. Yeah. So when Jesus is saying like, Hey, be careful about what your eye and your hand do, because it'd be better for you to lose your eye than for your whole body to be burned in Gehenna. And then it's translated literally hell in our Bibles. But what he is saying is Gehenna, that tar pit out or not tar, that fire pit out there where all the trash is being burned. And where people now have barbecues in Israel, it's super beautiful. I love it there. (laughs) Well, and and thematically, that makes more sense, right? Than Jesus talking Mm -hmm. about something that we do that happens to us after we die. But Jesus is saying this is a place of of being completely morally bereft and evil. And and, and this is a place of destruction, right? And so... Yeah, it is a place of destruction and uh, punishment and judgment. And that's all happening. And Jesus is constantly calling out hypocrisy like that. Like I'm thinking of when he calls the Pharisees whitewashed tombs that are filled with the bones of those they have consumed. Like that thematically, that makes more sense with the whole message of Jesus in general to translate it that way. Mm -hmm. But to get to a conscious, eternal torment of a hell, you have to jump several times to get to that. I I think what I'm trying to say is, the concept of like an eternal hell where people go to if they don't confess Jesus is actually foreign to the New Testament. It's this really modern. That's a modern yeah, idea. Yeah, something that we're reading back into it. That it a, a much more biblical version, a much more biblical vision, and a lot of people have been saying this lately, is something that people would refer, refer to as conditionalism. So I've said in the past that I'm an ism person, and I'm just going to do it right now. There's traditionalism. Right. Which is a traditional view that the church has been espousing for millennia, that there's this eternal conscious punishment that was really developed, especially in the medieval times. Um, And then there's conditionalism, which is, hey, there's this resurrection sometime at the end, you know, end of the world. And the righteous will be resurrected. The people who are facing judgment will be destroyed forever. So they're like annihilated. They're not sent to a hell. They're just not you know, resurrected or whatever. And then there's universalism, which is every single human being will be restored in the end. And I think that you can use biblical texts to argue for like conditionalism, that some people will be resurrected. Some people will face eternal death, not like a hell that's burning forever, but they're just going to be annihilated and possibly universalism that all things will be restored. But to say that there's this conscious eternal torment of a hell, you really have to do like gymnastics in the new Testament to get that kind of a vision. Well, so then the question is if it's so foreign to new Testament, how did it end up being interpreted that way? That's a very good question. I would always, (laughs) I have a, (laughs) I have a scapegoat in church history. I always point at Constantine and I use him as like a punching bag, right? Like he's my pinata. I always say when the church, (laughs) when the church got power, right? When the church took over and then pretty soon they had to tell people there's consequences to not being a Christian. That's, that's when things went out of control. For your birthday, Alan, I'm going to make a Constantine pinata. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> I'm going to fill it with tracks and uh, Gideon Bibles. <laughs> yes. Well, it is interesting how that functions as a means of control and power. And that sounds really conspiracy theory y, but, but to just think about how you can mobilize people by making them afraid of something really ominous like that. And it, especially if it doesn't have a lot of biblical backing, you have to. You have to ask when these things developed. And I think they developed over time. It's a very complicated answer. I mean, we'll put some resources to read up more on this stuff if you're interested in going into the details about this. But so my question is, okay, is to to the judgment thing again, if I can bring that back up, because I think that's a big question. So if if hell exists and there's there's a holding place and there is like judgment after death, if there is afterlife, first of all, and if second of all, if there is judgment after death, because a lot of people are really uncomfortable with the with the idea of no judgment because they want to see God as an ultimate judge who reinforces justice in the in the world. And one of the best ways to in, in, enforce that is to like tell people that you will be held accountable for your actions even after you die. Like you're responsible for this life on earth. Okay, so there's so many questions that spring from this. But my my biggest question is if that judgment exists, what happens after that judgment? Is there some kind of 
punishment? Do we need a kind of punishment for our theology to be substantial? What do you think? Well, I think that it's not just people need, you know, the the judging God. I think if you read the Bible, you get this sense that Jesus is winning over something. There is a victory over evil and death, and there is a restoration to justice. And that necessarily includes like the righting of wrongs. And so judgment and punishment are rolled up in that. Um, as far as what happens after that, it's actually a really it's a really good point um, against the traditional view of hell. If there is this eternal place where people are being punished, Jesus never actually wins. Like if we think about it, Jesus came to do away with evil, to gain like a victory for God in the in the New Testament. And if people are being punished forever, Jesus is just con- containing that evil, right? Jesus is just building a prison where people still experience the effects of evil, are being punished for their evil. And so there's almost this eternal segment of creation that's not ever fully redeemed or even fully punished. It's just this limbo where God is like refusing to be. And so I think that that's really problematic for people's view of what Jesus did. I've never heard that before. That's really interesting though. And is it really justice? That's a good question too. Mm -hmm. If, If it's true, like you have a life, let's say the average person lives about, or at least in America, 75 years or so. And they maybe they just live a horrible life and they just treat people like crap and they do whatever. Is eternity like 75 years, like eternity, a really a just that doesn't even fit Old Testament ideas of justice like eye for an eye. That's I like know. <laughs> eye for, you know. Yeah. Does the punishment fit the crime? I mean, Hammurabi, which is like one of the earliest law codes says, hey, the punishment has to fit the crime in some way. Right. And, that, and that's what we would say. And I'm like, Abraham, Abraham in the Old Testament looks at God punishing Sodom and Gomorrah and actually gets upset and says, is the God of the universe going to do justice? Is he is God really going to punish all of these people, even when there's righteous people in the in the city? So God, you know, Abraham barters God down to, hey, if this many people are righteous, don't destroy if this many people back and forth. So one of the earliest moments of a human being in the Bible really reckoning with God is this moment where a human being is saying, God, you need to be just. So when, so when I look at the concept of hell, you're totally right, Jeff. Does the punishment fit the crime? And if it doesn't, what does that say about our God? Well, it's funny you mentioned that particular text, because that text for me was a big catalyst for my shift away from this black and white view of heaven and hell, because there's, first of all, there's so much unknown. Like for anyone to make a definitive statement about what the afterlife is going to be is ridiculous, especially when scripture itself doesn't have a definitive view of it. And my belief lies in that God is a God of justice. So whatever happens after we die, it is, I believe it is based off the decision of a loving God. And that's not my point. My point is to help people where I am here and now and do stuff that makes a mat makes a difference. Cause even if someone is going to hell, like at least I should do is make their life here uncomfortable if they're or comfortable if they're going to go to hell. I might as well be super nice to them so that they have a little bit of, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it just seems so silly. There are some theologies out there, even some really contemporary theologies that say that God really does create some people for the purpose of damnation so that the elect can be elect. Okay, so... That's double predestination is what it's called. Double predestination. Yeah. I'm trying to use the big words, but... but It's like the opposite of a double rainbow, right? It's it's the opposite of a double rainbow. and It's an <laughs> anti-rainbow. Um, but to me, okay, so we've talked about this on previous, previous shows. The idea of determinism, meaning like our, our environments and our histories and what we've inherited genetically and how we've been treated growing up, like that all determines to a large degree our outcome as people. And the idea that social sin also exists. We've talked about that too, that that people are part of bigger systems than themselves. And to punish people on both of those accounts for things that really they are beholden to, to punish them as individuals to me for eternity seems to completely antithetical to justice. So I have a really hard time with believing that God would create, basically create some people as mistakes, as or not even mistakes, but like as intentional objects of wrath. You know, and, and some people would argue, well, we all deserve wrath, you know, because we've all sinned. But I just can't make that make sense with a vision of a God that loves at all. You know, that's there's a, a personal a personal story for me that that, that reminds me of. Um, I haven't really done a whole lot of thinking about hell. I don't know exactly where I'm at, whether I'm, you know, a conditionalist or a universalist or what that's all going to look like. But I did have a dream about 
a whole bunch of people, including me, were headed to hell. <laughs> I'm not going to give all the specifics, but we're like at this waiting period where we're actually moving toward this like portal or gate or whatever, where everyone's going to go to hell. And I got this really intense personal experience of what it would be like the moment before I stepped into this eternal conscious punishment. And I woke up from that dream and it just from that point on, I could not fit that concept of an afterlife with the God that I know in the New Testament. And so that catalyzed me to actually go through and study more about hell and about heaven because that those things just don't fit together in my mind. And I think that's what you're saying is that a loving God, which you find in the New Testament, and this is not about saying God's love is more important than God's justice and arguing that way, but a loving God consciously punishing someone for eternity. You know, uh, Benjamin L. Corey, the, the former fundy, made a, an amazing point. There was about a month ago, maybe a little bit longer, where ISIS, right, the, a terrorist organization, was burning people alive in cages, Christians. And the world looked at that in disgust. And like people even like saw the videos and stuff of people being burned alive. And there was rightly a reaction that was like, this is evil in its purest form. Well, if you believe God is going to be like ISIS and cage people for eternity and light them on fire, that's never going to end. Like, what does that say about God? Right. Like God, that would make God an evil person. Well, I mean, people could talk around that, though, and say, like, that's just what sin is to God. God is incompatible with sin. And therefore, God, ha- you know, it, when, when you withdraw God from a place that that is the default, is that evil and destruction and chaos takes over. And maybe God doesn't do that to them. But by withdrawing God's self, because God cannot be or touch sin in any way because God is holy, then. But, but withdrawing, but withdrawing the creator and the sustainer of the universe, withdrawing would mean non-existence. Like, we don't exist if it wasn't for the fact that God is sustaining the universe. Oh, well, that's a good counter argument. Yeah. Well, then there's the other argument that as a, a new parent, parenting metaphors seem to be <laughs> in my fo- the forefront of my mind. But like, would a loving parent not punish a child that does something bad? I mean, I hear that argument a lot. And not only that, but I, I've noticed a deep correlation between someone's view on heaven and hell and the way that they parent. Like there are hmm. Christian parenting styles that are very much about control and punishment and regulating behavior. And I think that that part of that whole heaven and hell thing, and and, and uh, Mona mentioned it uh, earlier in our conversation, is this idea of control. Is m- Part of how these things developed was that, well, how do we get people to do the right things? And, and I think in the long run, that creates more problems instead of encouraging people to be the right kind of person and making the consequences here and now as opposed to otherworldly and never really tangible. So there's a difference between punishing and and wrath and then correcting in love for the betterment and the growth and the and the and the the improvement of that person like for their own and some people would argue that wrath is for someone's own good but punishing someone eternally for all time with no ifs ands or buts. Would you do that with your kid? Would you be like, "Hey, there is if you do XYZ, I will forever write you off." No, you've looked in the, you've looked in my kids eyes. How could you say that to either <laughs> one of them? <laughs> But then some people would say you're confusing metaphors and that the God as a parent metaphor only goes so far. And and then so there's controlling metaphors. And I agree with that. But I think for a lot of people, it doesn't go so far. I think that's the end of it. So, you know, we've we've talked about, though, like punishment according to people's actions. But a lot of people would say, if you don't accept Jesus, that is hell for you. That's, that's your destiny, right? So that's I mm-hmm. think that's the crux of a lot of arguments is that is the in the for the most part, the evangelical argument is that we have to save people from hell and it's really easy all you have to do is accept jesus right yeah but they make judgments on whether they've accepted jesus based on their behavior so i think it still comes down to behavior the funniest thing in the new testament is that jesus never said that there are all these moments where jesus is evangelizing people and jesus could just say hey say this prayer accept me as your lord and savior and you will not go to hell jesus never once said that if you see jesus like teaching about it it's almost always like like Matthew twenty five, one of the I'm, most. I was just about to bring that up. Oh, oh but I'm stealing your thunder. No, Go don't ahead. steal it. Um, well, <laughs> I I I mean I've I've said this to people, and they said, well, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. You know, so they assume that that translates to mean that if you you have to accept Jesus in your heart and be a Jesus follower, right, and say that you're a Christian. However, Matthew twenty five is a great example. 
Um, it's uh, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the nations will be gathered before him. A- again, nations, that's a very political statement. He will separate sheep from the goats, right? Uh, most of us are pretty familiar. He'll put the sheep at his right hand, the goats to the left, and say to those at his right hand, you are blessed by the Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And I was a stranger and you welcomed me, so on and so forth. And um, the, the goats say, but we never saw you do any of these things. And he said, if you do it to your neighbor, you do it to me, right? So he's not saying adopt a creed or a theology or say that you're under the banner of one person or figure. Jesus is saying specifically and the end of the judgment when everything, whatever that is, because we don't know what it is, like you're saying, Jeff, we, do, we just can't know that. But whatever that is, at the end of the day, it's your actions, not your belief that makes the difference. Did you create heaven on this earth or did you create hell on this earth? What did you do with your time? Which goes against much of our, our theology, right? I mean, that, that's, that's unsettling for an evangelical to hear Jesus say that. Cause, cause I, I can, you know, I, I do have to bring this up there. There are nations coming before Jesus that in all probability in Jesus's own words would never have heard of Jesus Christ, right? Would never have heard of, the Messiah of Israel, because their nation's located so far away from from Jesus. So I can imagine some of the people saying, when did we hear of you? As if they had never heard of Jesus, right? And Jesus is saying, well, you're the way you treated other human beings, whether you knew me or not, is how you treated me. In my undergrad, we were told that every, and, and this is true, this is what a lot of conservative evangelicals teach, is that the world knows enough of God to be condemned but many people don't know enough to be saved. So they know enough of God's attributes by just looking at the world. This is Romans, Romans one. It's they called natural tes- theology, right? Mm-hmm. And they are testified to God's existence. But if they don't hear of Jesus and they don't confess with their mouth that Jesus is the Lord, they will not be saved. And they take that out of the new Testament. When Jesus said, when Peter's talking about, you know, confess and you will be saved that saying confess and you will be saved is not the same thing as saying, if you never confess, you won't be saved. Pe- people try to defend like missionary activity, becoming a martyr to help other people on the notion that if these people are not reached, they're going to go to hell. And I am constantly told if hell doesn't exist, why tell people about the gospel? Or the other side is if hell and heaven and hell doesn't exist, then why not just do whatever you want and, you know, go go around sinning and like, why does it all, why behave? And again, that's to me, it comes down to, to behavior. I think that there's a lot of people that are very comfortable and it's easy for them to relate with the world in black and white ways. So if I do this, then this will happen. And that's understandable. I think we all have places in our life where we do that, but it doesn't allow for the tension of real life. It doesn't allow for the highs and the lows, which the lows are difficult, but the highs are amazing. And if we kind of separate ourselves and try to create this life that's just this even keel, then, then where's the life that's abundant that Jesus talks about in that? I, I'm, I've become so cynical when I, when I hear people say something like that, like, you know, if there's no hell, then how can we preach Jesus? Actually, what I hear, I actually translate in this, my brain, and that maybe this is based on my interactions with whoever, but I hear, well, if there is no hell, then we're not allowed to be aggressive in telling you what to think and believe. <laughs> like the gospel doesn't have teeth. Actually, I hear people say this. So that's what it, that's what it is, is what motivates people? What's a motivating factor to change what you think and feel and believe and fear for some people is the best motive motivation for controlling other people. Like I I think when I first stepped away from fear, the moment I said, Hey, I'm not going to be afraid of getting my theology wrong of God punishing me. I'm just going to try to honestly come before this stuff and study it. And the moment I let go of fear, it changed my perspective of God. And I would say fear is a bad motivator that it actually obscures knowledge and faith and the pursuit of truth that if we're if we're afraid we're going to make decisions that are not the best decisions that we could be making and for me god is so much better of a motivator like the concept of unity with god and the restoration of the whole world the whole universe and all people is such an attractive thing that hell is is just pales in comparison like there's yeah but you have to let go of a doctrine of holiness to some degree to be able to get there because unity with god you have to be holy i could still say and this this is where the sticking point i think this is where you and i would probably disagree 
maybe on other stuff too, but I still think that it is possible. It is entirely possible that all people are going to be completely redeemed in the end. But I also think it's possible because of the witness of the new Testament. And it's something that I hold very highly that it is possible. Some people will not be resurrected in the end, that they will be experienced death forever because of the choices and the actions that they, that they did while on this earth. So you're an annihilationist. Uh, yeah, that's probably where I, where I come to is that meaning people just cease to be like, they, yeah. don't, they just don't get, they're not going to be punished, but they just cease to be, but they won't, they won't be a part of the resurrected reality that, that, that God is going to recreate the world. Well, before we get into that and where we all stand on that, I just, just one other thing, when someone comes to me and says, or when someone says, you know, well, why not just do whatever you want if there's no heaven and hell to me, that is, what I hear them saying is I really want to do these things, but I feel like if I do, then I'm going to be punished for them. That there's this um, the repression that's going on and that, that it makes life miserable. Like everything is like if – how many conversations did you have in youth group where you said if you weren't a Christian, what would you do? The implication being if I didn't have these held beliefs, there's these things that I would kind of want to do, but I know that I can't. And it prevents us from experiencing life. Like God has created this amazing world and these experiences with people and things to have. And a lot of people keep themselves from it for this irrational fear. You know what, Jeff? I've always wanted to have the experience of stealing your computer. So I think I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm just going to help myself. You know, I'll go for it. Cause then I can buy a new one. <laughs> That's the deterrent. That's the argument for deterrence, right? Like capital punishment deters people from crime. So therefore we need to have this like, execution hanging over everyone's head so that they won't do the worst things possible when it's shown that it actually has no like it's got a negligible effect on people's decisions i think the same thing goes with hell it's like you know it, it's not that great of a deterrent for me it's a really power it has been a really powerful understanding to to really get away from my idea of hell and really actually for me personally and I, i'll disagree with you on, on this a little bit alan but i don't I don't, um, I'm not drawn to an idea of afterlife in general. I really don't think anything really happens. I think it's nice to think about as a metaphor for why we should do certain things, I guess, but like bringing heaven to earth, I think in it like a symbolic sense for me is very powerful. I really like what Maltman talks about with resurrection being, you don't have to believe in a literal resurrection to still believe it's a really powerful symbol of hope amidst suffering. Right. But, um, so so, uh, just to add to what you're saying, although I disagree with you, I would say, the majority of what even the Bible talks about is this worldly. It is about yeah. bringing heaven to this earth and opposing the hell that is on this earth. It is not an escapist theology. Yeah, it's not escapism. But for me, that's really mobilizing to say, okay, that makes me kind of responsible. If I'm going to bring heaven on earth, I, I got to look at beyond these individual actions and codes of morality into what larger systems are doing and, and what what our, our societies are doing to make life palatable and pleasurable and kind for everyone you know so it's it's a it's a much to me that's a much bigger vision of the world and a much more exciting vision that as christians to act so, in social justice and to bring god's justice and heaven to earth is to act in love and is to walk out our faith directly one to one correlation and a lot of people don't understand this and it's very hard to explain that to them they're like well i don't see jesus in that like how do you not see jesus in that for me i think that First of all, I don't hold on to any idea that I have on the afterlife very tightly. So it's always evolving. But I think right now, I feel like I'm caught in the middle between those things. Is I, I believe in full restoration. I guess that would make me, if I'm going to put an ist or an ism to it, I'm a universalist. And the reason that I, that I can't go all the way to your side, Mona, is because I feel like there are things in this life that no matter how hard we work, they can't be redeemed. And I, I can't allow myself to get to a place where there's no hope in the, the light of eternity, that there can be some full restoration. Because even though we have bright spots of goodness and, and life-giving things through social justice and all kinds of different things, I'd, I still like to believe that one day there is going to be What What perfection. I hear you saying is perfection, yeah. yeah. But I don't believe in perfection. I think it's not, it's not compatible with finitude. Like I, because we are, the world is finite, we are finite, and we, we won't really know in infinity. Like we won't know it, it, eternality in the way that God does. Like, I don't think that we'll ever reach perfection. And I don't think perfection is compatible with Christianity. But restorate, but restoration would be. Restor- so my idea of restoration is not perfection. It's wholeness. It's not necessarily like the. It's not fixing all everything that's ever gone wrong. It's being in ultimate love and knowing somebody's ultimately loved and, and being treated kindly and loving others. I think that you make a really solid point. And I think that uh, 
that that's a huge distinction because I don't think we should live our life hoping in perfection. <laughs> Even though I just said that I believe that one day there'll be perfection. <laughs> well, well, this is this is why it's hard because some people pray for healing their whole lives, right? And they never get it. And so, what what do we tell those people? Like, well, you didn't hope, you didn't pray enough, or you know. And I know that's not what you're saying, so I'm interested to like tee this out a little bit. If you're charismatic, that's what you tell them. <laughs> <laughs> and some people do see miracles, and other people do not. You know, so it's it's like, what, what does God choose? Who God loves more? You know, in the same way that God just kind of randomly chooses who gets to go to hell and who gets to go to heaven. I mean, that would definitely be an episode for a different time talking about miracles, right? Yeah, that's, there yeah. You go. that's a good one. Yeah, mm-hmm. I just like to believe that that we're headed somewhere. That we're we're headed to something that is that is great. I don't know what you want to call it, utopia or whatever. I think there's a difference between being handed perfection and working towards close to it. I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, no, I agree with that, but I. Personally, I don't believe in a, a, what what some people call a myth of progress. Not myth like it's not true, but just like an idea or a belief in, in that we're always progressing and getting better because I think history shows us that it's not linear like that. You know, it's- I, w- I would agree with you. And then I would cap that off with saying, I believe with the witness of all those script- writers of scripture that there is a restoration that is coming, that God will restore all things in the end and make all things right. So there is an end, then you have to say there is an end. There is a hinge. How about that? A hinge? <laughs> a hinge moment when God restores all things. The only end I believe in is like climate change and like the earth burning up because of our own fossil emissions. <laughs> Seriously, right. that's hey, what, yeah, no, I don't believe that's... God has anything to do with that though. I think we've done that to ourselves. Mm-hmm. There are some really good theologians like John Polkinghorne who think that the universe is going to die a heat death, that everything's just going to spread out for for forever until no longer exists it just dissipates in energy and and dies then god resurrects and recreates the universe out of god's memory and there's reasons that that are really good for thinking that way um i don't know how all the mechanics of things are going to happen makes god sound like a computer like he's just going to reboot yeah you guys often seriously i really do think that we're like in the side of some like japanese supercomputer and like we have the appearance of consciousness but we're actually just like a giant um, test tube for that's so unitive that's so eastern <laughs> what <laughs> like you know the the very end of men in black when it's like just these two aliens like playing with marbles and like we're a universe inside of them i really do think that i mean, I mean but it's fun to do all these like mental acrobatics right and imagine worlds after worlds within worlds and i think that we should keep it that way like anything that's outside of that we can have fun speculating because i don't think we shouldn't talk about it because i think it's it's good to explore curiosity and imagination and, and even write stories about that. But when we present those stories as like, this is how it's going to end, you know, like certain movies that should be left behind by all of us, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> the, this idea that, well, I'm creating this fictional story, but it's really true because th- you need to watch out for these things. Yeah. And believe it, or, believe it. And, and it's an us or them sort of a thing. I, I think that's part of the idea for me. This is the takeaway for this whole subject is that there is a future to this world and there is a future to us. And that is the kingdom of God. That is the restoration and wholeness and justice for all people. And if you're not choosing and living a life that chooses justice and wholeness, you are not living into that future. I, I disagree, but I agree with the spirit of that. First of all, I I don't use the word kingdom because I don't like the King stuff. Like I think that's, very hierarchical. So I like kingdom, K I N, kingdom, because I'm a feminist. You you wouldn't say that the universe is hierarchical? Like God is above all of the universe? I'm a panentheist. So I believe God is like saturated the universe. I'm a panentheist too, but different than you. We've had this argument before. <laughs> we have, we have. Okay, we'll get into all that later. That means like God's relationship to the world. But I, I would say, even if someone who doesn't believe in the afterlife, I still think life is utterly sacred and utterly connected to God. And I don't think that you have to sacrifice those beliefs of of life being so precious and beautiful and holy and wonderful if the afterlife is not in the equation you know so i i guess i think like our actions shouldn't be shouldn't shouldn't be determined by a concept of afterlife either way because we can't know like you guys are saying we just can't know so it it really kind of doesn't matter that much like like they can be determined by the activity of god in the world and that is bending toward justice right whether we want to choose to join god or not no i don't think god does it i think i think we do it (laughs) it's synergy it's both maybe i think the bottom line is wherever you're at wherever you are if you see something that doesn't isn't right with the world whatever you can in your circle in your sphere of influence do something about it 
And I believe that when you do that, you fail or succeed, that heart and that motivation and that spirit in trying to make something wrong right is where we should all live. And thinking like interconnectedly and relationally, like how, how things connect in big ways is really an important part of it. Because we, I think we've all can agree though that just looking at like individual behaviors is not enough to think about these big concepts of justice and afterlife or, or heaven and hell. Can I, can I give a few uh, suggestions for listeners? Now a few suggestions and then we'll close out. Okay. Go ahead, Alan. So one, the stuff Mona's been talking about is systems. This is not just the concept of hell and judgment is not necessarily always an individual thing, but there's in the New Testament, there are systems being judged everywhere. And if you just take the book of Revelation, sit down sometime, don't read it with like a left behind sort of mentality, but read it as someone who is writing under an oppressive Roman regime with the the Jewish state or the Jewish uh, people having a weird relationship with Rome and all of them kind of oppressing Christians read that as a judgment on those systems and just read it through and think about it pretty deeply. And it's actually very life giving. And, um, and then my, my other couple of suggestions, if you are interested in the concept of evangelical conditionalism, which is like, you know, hell doesn't exist or only exists for a shorter period of time. Look up the rethinking hell website. We'll add links to that. You can listen to Benjamin L. Corey uh, on the former formal former Fundy uh, website. And Kurt Willems actually on the Pangea blog wrote a series on hell in 2012, like a four or five part series. That's really good. And then lastly, Nicholas Quint from Split Frame of Reference. Um, he has debates with some other seminarians and people who are thinking very deeply about these topics and they uploaded papers. So you can find that on the Split Frame of Reference, Reference blog. And we'll have links to all that stuff at the end. So let us know what you think, whether you think uh, what your belief about heaven and hell is, whether you prefer Kirk Cameron left behind or Nicolas Cage left behind. <laughs> uh, so if you have anything to add to the conversation, check out the show notes at irenacast.com slash 18, and there you'll find the links to all the things that we discussed. And then don't forget our uh, Facebook question on Wednesday so that you can interact more with this particular episode. So on the other side of the music this week, we are going to be doing weird news. So this week we are going to do a new segment. Uh, it's not necessarily it's not it's not necessarily it's not a game, but it's uh, we've all found a interesting or weird news story that we're just gonna kind of riff on, I guess. Wacky news. Wacky news. <laughs> yeah, we'll call it wacky news or Irena news. Yes. No. Stop no, making no, no, Irena no, cast no. puns. No. You're not allowed to do <laughs> it <don't> anymore. <laughs> Well, our whole show is a pun, right? We have to stick with the... Anyway. All right. Well, you clearly got something you're excited about, Jeff, so go for it. I, well, excited is a strong word. <laughs> um, I'm Irena excited. <laughs> <laughs> Irena no. excited. Okay. That was that was awful. All right. Uh, so I found this story I thought that was pretty, pretty funny. All right. Uh, so a story about a Superman fanatic who underwent 23 plastic surgeries to look like Superman. Oh, my God. I want to see this face. Is he scary? Wait, which Superman? Like Christopher Reeve Superman or like the newest one, Man of Steel? Um, just in general. I'm looking at the picture. It's kind of taken a little bit of all of them. Um, more of like the the typical comic book look to it. Uh, so I can I can show uh, Mona the picture right now and uh, we'll put it on the show notes. Look how pretty this guy is. That that guy has like permanent blush installed on in his face. That's kind of crazy looking. He does. Yeah. I, it looks like he's got uh, tattoo makeup. Yeah, that's wild. Okay, what's your second one? In Canada, a house that was worth like roughly $400,000 just got appraised for $1 when there was a native Canadian burial ground discovered on the property. Oh, like it ruined the property value? Yep. It just got appraised for $1, which means they don't have to pay property taxes, but still, that's pretty rough. (laughs) What? That's interesting, right? (laughs) No, how I, I would be so excited to walk out. First, they discover something that's like from the 1500s. Then they discover something from like 2000 BCE or something like that. I would be so excited. I would tell everyone about it. And then everybody would punish me for it, just like they did that guy. Oh, so you like resonate with him. So what's wacky so about these stories, though? That's wacky. A house is worth a dollar now. It's weird. I'd live there. <laughs>
on top of a burial ground? I'd buy that for a dollar. I would buy it and excavate <laughs> it and send stuff to museums. That would be awesome. And be haunted for your sacrilege. All right, Mona, what's your wacky news? Okay, I have a couple, but I think I'm going to go with this one. Uh, so in the UK recently, there was a cow that was injured and a local like worker was trying to save the cow, but there, the cow was in heat and there were four randy bulls trying to get at the cow. So the fire department was called and they had to hose down the bulls to save the <laughs> cow. <laughs> That's kind of funny, right? That's amazing. Yeah, it sounds kind of perilous. It's funnier that the firemen had to do that. I know, right? <laughs> Of all the things. <laughs> all right. Well, I think <laughs> I think that'll do it for us this week. <laughs> Thank you once again uh, for joining us. If you like what you hear, uh, help support the show by going to iTunes and Stitcher to rate, review, and subscribe. Uh, your ratings and reviews really help the show by making it much easier for people to find us. And uh, contact us anytime with your general questions on our feedback page, irenacast.com slash feedback. And there you'll find all the ways that you can contact us. Uh, like us, follow us, and basically stalk us in every way, shape, love, or form. Love us. Yes, exactly. Love us. Uh, so for this week, go to heaven. Heaven, I'm in heaven. I was waiting for. <laughs> All right. So for this week, I'm Jeff. I'm Mona. And I'm Alan. Thanks for joining the conversation.